Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to get to their seats and uh, we'll get started momentarily. Um, good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, the Global Health Policy Center. This is part of our regular speaker series and um, we're thrilled today to be hosting Peter Small who for the last six years has been the Senior Program Officer and Team Leader for Tuberculosis at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We, we, we spoke with Peter, Charles Freeman and I visited with him way back in September and put on the table the idea that we were hoping he would come to CSIS and, 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 and speak specifically about drug resistance to tuberculosis. Um, and, and he kindly has agreed to do that, so welcome, Peter, and thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule uh, to come and be with us um, here. Um, Peter's been in the lead at the, at the foundation uh, in developing its tuberculosis strategy, building core partnerships, hiring and managing the TB team, and serving as the foundation's voice on tuberculosis. He received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University, medical degree from University of Florida, and did his postgraduate training in internal medicine at UCSF, and infectious diseases at Stanford University, where he also served on faculty uh, before joining the um, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's arguably uh, among Mer America's foremost experts on tuberculosis. He's published more than 100 articles and chapters and a number of landmark studies uh, in, the, in the key journals uh, and uh, has been a, a leading strategist as well on how to uh, bring forward a more effective international mobilization politically and institutionally to bring forward the, 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 the global uh, TB agenda. So with that, thank you so much, Peter, for being with us. Welcome, the floor is yours. Uh, we'll follow his presentation with some comments and questions. Thank you. Um, you know, <clears throat> hearing that introduction, I'm uh, reminded of the fact that uh, I actually, in medical school, never learned about the two diseases that uh, dominated my professional life in 1981. HIV was unknown and tuberculosis was thought to have been conquered. Uh, the, the myth that uh, tuberculosis was a disease of antiquity was dispelled for me uh, at, during my medical training at San Francisco General Hospital where I was treating increasing numbers of immigrants and AIDS patients with tuberculosis. But the full consequences of this misconception and the decades of neglect that that has spawned became apparent to me in 1990 when I was working at Muambili Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. <clears throat> this was my first exposure to the real world in which TB and HIV collude to overwhelm underfunded medical systems. And at Muambili Hospital at that time was Tanzania's largest hospital. It was a teaching hospital with about 3,000 beds and an average census that was almost twice that. So on the ward that I worked in, we had uh, TB patients and AIDS patients sharing beds, shoulder to shoulder in the same beds. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say that, that as a clinician, uh, I'll never forget the patients who died because of the things that I did. Um, but. But there's something particularly haunting about the people who died because of what we didn't do in that hospital. And what we didn't do in that hospital was pay attention to interrupting TB transmission and protecting those patients from getting infected while they were in the hospital. It was partly because we had lousy tools. We still have lousy tools today, and I'll, I'll get to that. But by the time we knew a patient had tuberculosis, they'd already infected probably a dozen other people in the hospital. Um, and I don't know for sure, but I suspect that, that many of those AIDS patients who got infected with tuberculosis in that hospital on my watch subsequently died for lack of therapy. I returned to the United States uh, to complete my subspecialty training at Stanford University Medical Center. 
Uh, I was very uh, enthusiastic at that time about the use of high-tech molecular bacterial DNA fingerprinting as a way of tracking who was infecting who in the city of San Francisco. It was a truly exhilarating time <clears throat> for me. I was publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine on an annual basis and, and, and generating data about, about what was going on and what was fueling this uh, uh, resurgence of TB uh, that I think helped the TB control program in San Francisco to control uh, the situation. However, uh, with time it became increasingly clear to me that uh, the world that the real TB problem was not in the United States and, and that the world was only going to go so far in controlling TB with the lousy tools that we currently rely on. I think we're all uh, fortunate, whether we know it or not, uh, that, that, that Bill and Melinda Gates are an incredible uh, couple who have a profound belief in the power of science and technology to, to solve big problems. I, for one, am incredibly fortunate that uh, it, six years ago, Helene Gale recruited me to Seattle uh, to, to design and, and implement a TB program for the Gates Foundation. And um, it, was, uh, it was in the early months uh, that when I was in Seattle that uh, Bill and Melinda real, fully realized, and I think we're completely shocked to realize, that uh, a global epidemic that was killing somebody every 20 seconds had as its primary intervention tools a diagnostic test that was 125 years old, a vaccine that was 80 years old, and drugs that hadn't changed for 40 years. The foundation has now committed more than $875 million of their money uh, to, uh, to rectifying that situation. And increasingly, I'm getting nervous to think that all of those investments will have no impact if we don't get these tools out there. Thus, it's, uh, it's really, I, I totally appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to this crowd. Uh, I'm told that you understand political will and resource mobilization. Um, in fact, as I was packing for this trip, uh, I, uh, I asked my wife, I said, Delaney, can you believe <clears throat> that I'm flying across the country to talk to a room full of people in the hopes of a TB nerd somehow helping to close a billion dollar a year funding gap. I mean, in your wildest dreams, did you ever think that I would be doing this? And, and she said, Peter, you've never been in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so with that send off, <laughs> on the plane, I put together a talk uh, in which I'll briefly expand on the TB problem, and uh, but spend most of my time um, describing the new tools and the innovations that are coming down the pipeline and some of the encouraging signs that uh, increasing political leadership, not just among traditional donors, but also from the emerging economies who have high rates of drug-resistant TB, uh, may finally be rallied uh, to, to combat this disease. You know, my, my medical school teachers were not alone in thinking that tuberculosis uh, was a thing of the past. Uh, and yet, just because TB isn't making headlines, it, it doesn't mean that it has gone away. Globally, tuberculosis remains a huge problem and has the potential to get worse. Next week, the World Health Organization will release their new report. And this year, the actual number of TB cases will once again have increased, this time, to 9.3 million cases. And this year, the number of TB deaths will once again have increased, this time to 1.8 million deaths, placing TB just behind AIDS and global fatalities. Now, tuberculosis is, is a bacterial disease. Uh, it, it causes pneumonia. When someone with that pneumonia coughs, it, they, the, the pathogen turns them into little atomizers, little perfume bottles around, just spreading through the air, infectious particles, which if somebody has the bad judgment to inhale, uh, will create an infection, and in many cases, that infection will be controlled, and the people will become latently infected. In fact, a third of the world is latently infected and lives in this tenuous balance between a, a pathogen and their immune system. How many people in this room know their tuberculin status, whether their skin test is positive or not? That's good. I won't ask who is infected, but I'm going to just guess off the bat that looking at the demographics, it's about 20 or 25 percent. 
There are about 15 million latently infected people in the United States, and any, at any point, any one of them can reactivate and spread disease to others. But this issue about the, immune, the central role of the immune system in checking TB is most dramatic in sub-Saharan Africa, where the convergence of the HIV and TB epidemics have totally changed the disease. Rather than people getting in, inhaling, getting infected, and staving off disease, in the absence of an immune system or in the, in the presence of a decimated immune system, uh, they inhale the bacteria, they get sick, and without treatment, they promptly die. And this is really what is fueling the TB epidemic throughout sub-Saharan Africa and many other places in the world. Each year, 1.4 million HIV-infected people will develop TB, and 456,000 in the most recent data died from it. This makes tuberculosis the leading cause of death amongst people with HIV. It's shocking to me that while we can prolong a life with antiretroviral therapies, we still are incapable of saving a life with $14 worth of drugs. It's, it's particularly tragic from a public health perspective because TB control is one of the most cost-effective public health interventions. $14 can save a life and stop the spread of the disease. It really works well when it's done perfectly, and yet it is really hard to do perfectly with those antiquated and inadequate tools. When it's done imperfectly, treatment of tuberculosis, rather than curing patients, turns them into chronic secretors of drug-resistant TB. And drug-resistant TB is, is a, really a very significant threat because what we're talking about is an airborne epidemic of an increasingly untreatable disease. Last year, there were half a million cases of multidrug resistant TB. These are patients who are re resistant to the, to the standard antibiotics that are used. And uh, if those patients are treated inappropriately, and to, and to treat them, you need 12 to 18 months of therapy. And if you don't do that right, then they will become resistant to more antibiotics, so called extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, for whom treatment options are severely limited. Now, to adequately address tuberculosis in the context of these new challenges of HIV and MDR, the TB community needs to embrace an entirely novel concept, and that concept is innovation. The TB community is incredibly disciplined in execution, but has really not taken on the challenge of innovation. And without innovation, we are not going to make progress. I would point to USAID as, as being innovated. 75 percent of the USAID money is, is spent at the country level helping countries respond to the needs that they're perceiving on the ground. For example, in Tanzania, evaluating the nature of the drug resistance problem and figuring out how to use both the existing and the new technology as it comes online. The primary focus of the Gates Foundation TB program is innovation mostly centered to date on technologies, namely uh, new diagnostic tests, new drugs, and new vaccines. The majority of our investments in these activities are with the so-called public-private partnerships or the product development partnerships. Um, these are, are nonprofit organizations who use the best practices of industry to develop new, the tools that the world needs and these investments are made by the Gates family not with an eye on the dollars made, but rather in terms of the life saved. The, these organizations partner with for-profit sector in terms of gaining access to know-how and to intellectual property to accelerate the development of these tools. And we desperately need these new tools. In particular, diagnostics is... is, is uh, the current test I mentioned is 125 years old. I didn't mention the fact that it misses half the cases. The most commonly used test for drug resistance takes two months to get return results back to the patient. In, in the context of HIV, that just is filed in the chart because the patient's usually dead by then. Unfortunately, we are making great progress in the development of, of new diagnostic tests. 
Better and faster liquid cultures are available. They've been endorsed by the World Health Organization, and they are being rolled out by programs such as Unitate and, and PEPFAR. Through one of our product development partnerships, FIND, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, molecular diagnostics are becoming available which will allow you to know within hours and not months whether a patient has drug-resistant TB. We need to move rapidly to get these tests from licensure into the field, and in particularly in the context of drug resistance, because you cannot confront drug resistance if you don't know that it's out there. What's most important, exciting to me is the, the prospect that in 2012, uh, industry will have for us some really transformational rapid diagnostic tests, which will be much easier to use and put the power of knowledge into the hands of the practitioner at the healthcare centers. We also desperately need new drugs. Current first line drugs are cheap. They've got that going for them $14 for six months of, of pills. I think that's what I spend in a week and a half on my Zyrtec. Um, but they, they, that they've not really changed in 40 years, and, uh, and, and they require multiple drugs for a minimum of six months. Because of this, many patients don't complete their therapy, and, that, and that's part of what is spawning this epidemic of drug-resistant TB. Again, fortunately, we are making great progress in the development of new TB drugs. A four-month treatment regime is in a phase three trial by one of our grantees, the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development. And a number of pharmaceutical companies have gotten fully engaged, and there are now three new drug candidates for which there are exciting phase two uh, trial results. My expectation is that in the year 2016 or 17, we'll have a regime that will work to treat these drug-resistant cases. And finally, we desperately need new vaccines. The current TB vaccine was invented before the car, and it has had little or no impact on the epidemic in adults. An effective vaccine is the ultimate game changer in the fight against tuberculosis. And again, fortunately, we are making great progress. Five years ago, there was virtually nothing going on in terms of a coordinated process to develop TB vaccines. Today, there are six vaccines that are either in or will soon begin human trials. Any one of these has the potential to be the vaccine that we need uh, to protect people from tuberculosis. Uh, and I'm optimistic that around uh, 2016, uh, we may have an improved vaccine license for tuberculosis. Every bit is exciting as the technical progress for me are the signs that there is increasing political commitment and action to combat tuberculosis. In particular, two upcoming meetings by Brazil and China have the potential to galvanize increased global action against tuberculosis. Uh, President Lula will open the Stop TB Partners Forum in Rio on March 23rd. And at the beginning of April, the Vice Premier of China, the Director General of the World Health Organization, and Bill Gates will open a meeting in uh, Beijing. And the meeting in Beijing is hosting uh, the Ministers of Health from the 27 countries who have the highest burden of drug-resistant TB. China is also showing uh, uh, some initiative uh, in that they have ensured that MDR-TB has been inserted onto the World Health Assembly uh, agenda for this year. In addition to these meetings, there are early signs of new political leadership on tuberculosis from high burden emerging economies. China, India, Brazil, South Africa, throw in a couple of others, and suddenly you have half the world's tuberculosis and more than half of the world's drug resistant TB. These uh, countries who are increasingly vocal leaders on trade, politics, and health and science are showing some genuine leadership in confronting their own tuberculosis problem. If they do this, I think it will have broad and global impact. In addition to the obvious in, uh, commitment that, that Brazil and China are, in, are showing, India has a burgeoning pharmaceutical industry which is already making 
the existing drugs for much of the world. South Africa, where TB and HIV in combination is a huge problem, is increasingly vocal on tuberculosis and is home to some of the most critical clinical trial uh, that are now underway in terms of vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics. I think as it evolves, uh, emerging economy leadership on TB can further catalyze a global response. In the established global health paradigm, rich countries come up with solutions and pay for it for the rest of the world. For tuberculosis, emerging economies can complement and expand on this important work. And over the long term, if the emerging economies take care of their own problems, it will free up the resources from the rich world to focus on the truly needy uh, regions. Now, if the emerging economies do show leadership, it will also free up the rich world to do what we do best. And I think one example of this is, is uh, that with the increase in funding on USAID and PEPFAR, uh, they are now reaching out and providing technical assistance to assess the MDR situation in these overwhelmed countries and to help them to understand what the appropriate response is. For countries who don't yet have an MDR program, they're providing technical assistance on how to prevent it and for those that already have a problem on how to treat it. But none of these plans that are being hatched will, will have any impact without money. And it's clear that a lack of funding for TB contributed to the resurgence of tuberculosis between 1985 and 1992 in this country. That combined with the general neglect of our public health system in, in New York City uh, resulted in an epidemic of drug-resistant TB there that cost more than a billion dollars for the city alone to clean up. Partly in response to this, the U.S. government uh, in 1992 instituted the Federal TB Task Force Action Plan on TB, which has decreased the incidence of MDR TB domestically uh, by 75 percent, down from 485 cases in 1993 to only 119 cases in 2007. The U.S. should be commended for increasing uh, TB funding since, 2000 and since the year 2000, but there's still far more that needs to be done. The 2009 budget that, uh, that Congress recently passed in includes in the State Department and Foreign Operations $162 million for TB, which is a $9.5 million increase over the prior year. The USAID has increased its funding for TB from $22 million in 2000 to $93 million in 2005. In 2008, the NIH spent about $160 million on TB. And the recent $48 billion reauthorization for PEPFAR includes $4 billion for, uh, for treatment, TB treatment and prevention over the next five years. I think that if all of these monies are well spent and wrapped up together, that it provides an opportunity for the new administration to, to build on a very solid commitment and become a global leader on tuberculosis. The Global Fund has helped to, to mobilize the global resources. Around 7, about 14 percent of the funding went to, to TB. Uh, to date, uh, the Global Fund has, has treated 4.6 million uh, cases of tuberculosis. Um, but, but it needs to continue to do much more if we're going to continue to have progress in the context of these challenges of HIV and MDR. To give you some sense of the magnitude of the gap, the Stop TB Partnership uh, has a global plan. It's a bit of a business plan for the world in terms of what the response needs to be, what it will cost, and what the implications will be if they do. In that, there's a funding gap of $31 billion, including uh, $22 billion for implementation and $9 billion for tools over the next decade. Well, let, let me end uh, with a few thoughts of, about the future. Um, look over history, TB has thrived in the context of poverty and social unrest. And, and the economic downturn that, that we're in right now presents a really serious challenge to gain, continuing the momentum that we've gained over the last decade. And I think it may become the mycobacteria's best ally. Despite all our progress, today someone still dies of tuberculosis every 20 seconds, and drug resistance is spreading. 
With the economic crisis, TB is poised to become an even greater threat. I think now more than ever, the world needs to pull together to expand our efforts on TB. We need to continue to build on the existing momentum, the meeting in, in Rio, in Beijing, the G20, the World Health Assembly, and the Pacific Health Summit, which will be in Seattle in mid-June. But most exciting to me is the possibility that the high burden emerging economy leadership could accelerate access to existing TV tools and the development of new, more effective technologies. As the emerging economies address their own TV problems, they, they can have this global impact and, and, and their bio, far, biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies can use TB to apply their competitive advantage in new ways to diseases that are much less competitive than the cardiovascular and neurologic realms in which they're currently competing. At the same time, China, India, Brazil, and other emerging economies have a strong interest in engaging and supporting less developed countries. Through partnerships and twinning programs, these countries can share innovative TB tools particularly with Sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, and, and I think most importantly for this group, uh, the U.S. has to continue to support the TB programs. As the Andrew Speaker case highlighted, in this globalized world, MDR TB anywhere is MDR TB everywhere. We've seen what happens when we ignore tuberculosis in New York City. But we've also seen what happens when the U.S. commits to having an impact on global health. PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative have helped millions of people and has become a source of national pride. I think that now is the time for this country to apply the same level of commitment to tuberculosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, let me put a couple, just a couple of quick questions out uh, and uh, ask you to respond to those, and then we'll invite our audience to step forward with some comments and questions. Um, the picture you paint is of a shift of consciousness among the major emerging, um, emerging economies towards greater leadership, awareness of this factor of TB and XDR, MDR, TB is requiring a higher level of attention and um, an effort, and is that something that you're reasonably confident is going to be durable through the through this period? There's this broader question around how the 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 global economic crisis is going to impact these emerging economies. Will they stunt their demand growth? Will they change their budget processes internally? Will they change their diplomatic strategies outside their borders? They aspire to be donors. They aspire to be leaders. They're taking a greater stake in multilateral institutions and the like. They've pulled the global fund in on many different ways. So as we look forward in this really unprecedented, crisis-driven setting, how do you see the TB agenda? I mean, without, without knowing, but how would you expect to see how that agenda is going to be understood and acted upon in a in a period where there's greater uncertainty, a certain level of triage and fear and insecurity around this. And we know historically that in similar severe downturns that health budgets take a big hit. Education budgets, social services take a big hit. That's one question. The other is around the U.S. foreign policy. We know that now we have a reopen, we're, we're moving towards a period of re-engagement with South Africa, for instance. We have a new administration. We've had a, we've had a pretty grim period in terms of our, our bilateral linkages. Now we have a new foreign, a new health minister, Barbara Hogan. We're going to have a transition of power looking forward. If you could say a bit more about South Africa and what you see as the prospects there, because within U.S. foreign policy in this administration, the South African relationship is figuring as one of the priorities mm -hmm. looking forward. Yeah. And, 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 and TB prospectively and HIV may occupy a significant place. So if you could just talk, comment on those two <coughs> issues. Yeah, well, let me um, start by coming clean about what I am and what I'm not. 
Uh, my training is in epidemiology, and, and, and I think what we're looking at is perhaps an early trend from the perspective of, of tuberculosis, this, this general sense with these meetings, the, the promises that our leaders are making. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I'm not saying that this is a fact. I, I'm saying that this, this may be an early trend that we're picking up. Um, I've been wrong before in my epidemiology, so I, I – I also, though, to say what I'm not, I, I'm not an economist, and so I, I really kind of came here hoping to hear some discussion from you folks about what you think of this idea, and in particular what you think of the economic uh, situation. I will say that, that, that everything that happens in tuberculosis happens in slow motion and over the long haul. And so we're not talking about what's going on in the next six months or even in the next couple of years. I think what we're looking for is, uh, is something that will, if it happens, occur over the next decade and that in a decade from now, looking back, that, that w there will have been an inflection point uh, and we may be there now. I I'm optimistic in the long term for a couple of reasons. I would say um, first and, and foremost is that it is clearly in the best interest of these countries to address this problem in contrast to some of the other issues which, uh, which they're struggling with, they themselves bear the brunt of this problem. Uh, and uh, as the World Bank analysis has shown, investing in TB control is an incredibly good investment. The return on investment uh, is on the order of 15 to 1. So I, I think that there are, there are very um, selfish reasons why uh, these countries um, will do so, and, 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 and not just the countries, but I also suspect that the industries within those countries uh, will, will come to think of the fact that, that there are 10 million cases in the world and that, that a third of the world is infected with this germ as, as an opportunity and that, that, uh, that perhaps uh, that in the process of developing a drug which can be used for active disease, if a company stumbles over a drug that can be used to treat latent infection, that is a huge global market. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm, I'm not the right one to answer the question. Nor am I really that familiar with South Africa, so you're probably starting to wonder why I'm here. Um, I, I have been uh, very impressed with the tuberculosis situation in South Africa. It's uh, the rates of TB there. Uh, defy what I, as an academic modeler, could ever get my computer to generate. I mean, it's just phenomenal how bad the tuberculosis situation is and inexplic inexplicable. I mean, part of it is, 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 is neglect. There's no question that the country has, has, has profoundly neglected their, uh, their TB uh, situation. <clears throat> and, and for a country like that to to deny that there's a link between TB and HIV is, is, uh, is only going to, to have them, you know, fighting with one or two hands behind their back. Um, but I am incredibly optimistic uh, by the political changes, as I understand them, and that Barbara, Barbara Hogan, in one of her, her first public speeches, which was at the uh, uh, AIDS vaccine uh, conference, came out very clearly uh, stating that, uh, that TB and HIV was going to be a priority for her. So. So South Africa um, impresses me with the magnitude of their problem, but also with the, the political sea change that, that, that I think we're seeing. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite three or four folks to offer comments and, and questions. We have microphones. Please just stand up and, and identify yourself. Yes, Lisa? Hi, Peter. Thanks very much. Um, Lisa Carty from CSIS. Uh, um, two related questions. Um, first is, in the global um, TB plan, which I believe is a $50 billion plan, as you said, there's a number of actions enumerated. Um, I wonder if you could comment on what you think the technical capacities are at the country level to actually deliver on that plan, and whether there are things within the current architecture around TB, whether it be the Green Light Committee or something else that needs to be adjusted or ramped up. That's the first question. And second question, there's an ongoing big debate about health systems in general and how do health systems intersect with vertically targeted programs or diagonal or horizontal. I mean, what's your 
view, informal or otherwise, on the adequacy of health systems to now um, support a, a very broad and rapid global scale up on TB. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have other comments or questions just now? Right here. Christine Lubinsky, IDSA. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I guess I was wanted to follow up on your remarks about the President's Malaria Initiative and, and PEPFAR. And uh, some of us have been thinking in our advocacy about TB that um, we it might be worthwhile to try to uh, persuade the Obama administration to embrace tuberculosis in the form of some kind of a presidential initiative. It does seem, if you just look at the data and you look at the relative spending levels, that there's no doubt that that kind of level of presidential commitment has made a real difference, both in terms of coordination across government as well as in terms of absolute dollars being spent on the problem. And, um, and we have quite a fragmented response, um, albeit robust in its various departments in the U.S. government, it's still quite fragmented. You have research going on in three places and programming and so on. So I just wonder what your thoughts are about that, again, as a way perhaps to get the TB community of something concrete to rally around as well as a mechanism to really try to bring TB funding and some of these important interventions to the field and through phase three trials, all of which are going to be challenged under current U.S. funding levels. Thanks. Brenda? And we'll come back to you. Uh, yes. Um, I was just wondering, uh, listening to you say that WHO is about to come out with the report uh, next week announcing another increase in the number of people infected with uh, TB around the world. So I guess my, my question is, having sort of followed this for the last um, decade or so, is when we're going to turn the corner on those kinds of reports. Uh, makes it a lot, it makes it very difficult to do my job. Uh, as a reporter, you know, it's sort of like if nothing changes, there's nothing to report. Um, and when somebody is going to roll out some of these new technologies of which we know some things about, you know, the diagnostics, whether some of the money that's rolling around that's out there is going to be invested in getting these into countries and whether the countries are capable of using them, whether they have the infrastructure to be able to use them. I realize I'm packing a lot of things in here, but um, I guess I want to know what sense there is going to be of some real serious change or whether we're going to have to wait until 2016 when all of those wonderful things you talked about will be rolled out. So, uh, what? I just what? wanted to add to the lady from IDSA. Please. Uh, Jack Dalrymple. I work with a couple of companies that have TV vaccines. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bombarda Services has a project bioshield program and then a pandemic uh, flu program, and uh, they are attempting to have a one portfolio effort with DOD and NIAID and HHS and USAID potentially here. If, if the Obama administration could get through the economic situation and then propose something like was in the last, you know, the bioshield program and the uh, the big boost that. that NIAID got back in 2002 following the anthrax attacks and, and to have a coordinated approach. And, um, you know, that seems to be maybe the, the type of thing that they could rally around. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. The second question is, do you see that there's money available uh, for the more costly phase three trials of vaccines that will need to be uh, conducted after phase two? Okay. Well, a lot of questions. See if I can remember them all. Um, I, I think that the global human capacity manpower issue is, is, is a massive problem, and it's not restricted to tuberculosis, obviously. It, it cuts across all, all diseases. I, 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 where I am optimistic about tuberculosis, it is in the basic intervention programs are very well defined. The manpower needs are clear. And the, the value for that investment is, is an obvious one. So 
uh, while clearly there's not enough manpower to execute the, the plan of the TB community or any community that I'm aware of, uh, I, I am optimistic that you can make a very coherent argument for, for, for doing so. Um, I, I think that this, this issue of, uh, of health systems and the vertical horizontal debate, which seems to be such an obsession of, 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 uh, of policy people, in my limited experience, it goes away in, on the ground where where you may be the the tuberculosis uh, person, but your your clinic is in fact providing uh, care at the health center level for a whole spectrum of diseases. So I, I sometimes feel as though uh, this uh, argument about the vertical versus horizontal and, and ultimately we kind of settling on the diagonal is is uh, is a little bit of a, it, it gets tedious, I think, um, and. Uh, uh, the the issue of whether these systems will be able to roll out new technology is a, is a problem, however, that, that terrifies me. So, I mean, it, it, it uh, because, you know, the, the time that we're going to turn the corner is going to be when we fully implement what we can do today and when we start to experiment on large scale with, uh, with other interventions. And, and if we just look at the malaria field for a moment, you know, they, they're, they're way ahead of us. They have a, a rapid diagnostic test. In fact, there are 60 of them that you can buy. And yet, uh, the WHO has recently evaluated these and roughly two-thirds of them are no better than a coin toss. So, so how do you roll out a new diagnostic test when there is, in fact, no regulatory framework? Are we going to assume as we roll out these new diagnostic tests that, uh, that the um, manufacturers will only make and sell quality products, that, the, uh, that every country will have its own stringent regulatory uh, body, that the WHO is going to pre-qualify every manufacturer in the world? I mean, I don't know which of those thoughts is more ludicrous, really. Um, so so I, I do think that now is the time to start thinking about those issues, start using uh, incremental increases in uh, the health system as it exists to deliver today's products in a continuous process that segues into the delivery of innovative tools as they become available. And, and in so doing, it's, it's a much more holistic problem than, than you know, dots versus innovation. Um, I, I, I think there's no question that, uh, that, that the United States doesn't get appropriate credit for what we are doing in tuberculosis. And USAID has done an incredible amount of work in Eastern Europe on drug-resistant tuberculosis, and no one in America knows it. It seems like a pretty well-kept secret to me. And, and any effort to, to, uh, to, to both uh, amplify and give credit for the work that we are doing as well as, as to bring in uh, new resources and, as you point out, increasing efficiency. Um, the, the WHO report that's, that's coming out, is, it's, it's, a, it's like uh, the last 13 reports. There, it's a book full of numbers. As a TV nerd, I, I, I myself find that interesting and exciting in and of itself, but I understand that your world's different and just having the ability to know how many People between the age of 16 and, and 25 had extra pulmonary TB in Rwanda last year is, has no value, really, until you can translate that into a message that, 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 that the world buys into. And, and I don't know what the message of this year's report is. The facts speak for themselves at some level. You know, it, it is true. Uh, it's, it's very much the half full, half empty. And the WHO and the Stop TB Partnership in particular have been tone deaf to anything but the half full. Uh, message and and you know the fact is that y I, I was involved in tuberculosis for for a dozen years before it struck me that while TB rates are going down, which is all I ever read in the headlines, the actual numbers, the only thing we really care about, are going up every year. So so somehow you know there's there's a, a very mixed message there. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of success stories, and and I think that that's the bottom line, is that. While we may be looking at an overall picture uh, which is half full and half empty, there are innumerable success stories that show that when there is the political will and when there is the commitment, that, that, that lives can be saved with the tools we have and that, that progress will be accelerated in the future. And in fact, the, the, the mechanism for rolling those uh, new tools out is not known. But, but this is where uh, the experimentation and the innovation 
uh, is, in my mind, most exciting. So if you look at, for example, uh, what UNITAID is doing with the Global Lab Initiative and uh, the, some of the things that the World Bank is talking about doing in terms of rolling out um, uh, laboratory systems so that our patients will finally know. I mean, diagnostics is the most empowering thing. It gives, it gives a, a patient uh, the ability to demand the treatment they need. It gives the healthcare provider uh, the ability to do the right thing, and it gives the whole system the chance to, to actually uh, even make some money in the process in terms of, of, of making this uh, something that is self-sustaining. And, and, and uh, so I, 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 I think that, uh, that without – there are stories out there to be told. I don't think it's buried in the World Health Report. Um, and then, and finally, in terms of uh, the um, the uh, the TB vaccine situation and, and just advocacy in general for tuberculosis, uh, it, uh, it's, it's been interesting to me how tuberculosis advocacy, while tuberculosis has been smoldering uh, with subtle changes, that the U.S. attention to it uh, has had several bumps, and with each bump, it has kind of quietly, complacently slipped back to baseline. The, the bump of drug-resistant TB in, in, in New York City, uh, they got a lot of attention. It, it certainly ratcheted up uh, investment in, in the research that, that probably uh, led to the, to the, to the vaccines that, that, that your groups are working with um, in some way or another. Uh, that, that, that the push then just fell back. And, and actually, it was Andrew Speaker who did more for raising awareness about tuberculosis than any you know, $30 million campaign that, that, that we could ever fund. Um, but then again, it, it seems as though we've fallen back into uh, a sense of complacency. And, and, and I don't know really how with this sort of rolling thunder in the distance that could come out of these large global meetings that gets translated into a message that, that continues. Um, clearly part of that message has to be that in product development, and vaccines are not alone in this, but in all product development, the easy part are the early parts. That's, and, in, and, and, and that the big expense comes in the later trials. And uh, if we look at, at the global budget for R&D in the last year for which data were available, it's about, if I'm remembering correctly, $410 million. What, what is that all about? $410 million? The whole world is spending on basic and apply drugs, diagnostic, and vaccine, less than half a billion dollars? We've been through numbers of exercises to say what should that number be, but, but no matter how you approach it, whether you start uh, by getting some uh, advocates in a room or, or whether you start by getting some technical people together to, to, to build that number from the bottom up and say, well, this vaccine trial is going to be here at this point. It's going to cost this much. It, it's grossly underfunded, and, uh, and, and that's, that's got to be part of, part of the message. Uh, about a third of the funding uh, is uh, going to drugs right now, actually a lot of that coming from industry. Um, I believe the uh, – Vaccine numbers on the order of of 28, 29 percent of that. Um, most of that's coming from uh, from governments, actually. And uh, and the challenge with the vaccines, you know, with a, with a diagnostic, before you start to produce a diagnostic, you have a pretty good sense it's going to work because that's just the way the industry is. Drugs tend to die early in in the development process before you've invested a lot of money. The huge challenge in vaccines is going to be that you don't know until the end when you break the code on an expensive trial whether it worked or not. And, and so I think that the issue of phase three funding for all products is a critical one, but for vaccines in particular. Thank you. Next round right here. Please identify yourself. Yep, I'm, I'm John Fawcett with results. Um, just maybe a, a quick answer actually to Ms. Wilson's question about sort of what the headline might be. My understanding is one of the data points in addition to sort of incidents and deaths is a pretty serious revision of uh, the number of people that are co-infected with TB and HIV. So um, if, if hopefully WHO will write, that, will write that headline for you and, and that will be an easy story to write. Um, I want to just maybe make a point and ask a question. I think you've laid out several of the sort of compelling components of 
the case for expanded U.S. leadership in TB. I just wanted to maybe add another one and get your thoughts on that. And that is, um, you've talked about Sub-Saharan Africa, you've talked about emerging economies. It seems there's also a set of countries where the U.S. has a very real um, strategic security interest, which is coincident with huge um, TB burden and also particularly high rates of drug-resistant TB. So yeah. Afghanistan, Pakistan, but also then the sort of other stands in terms of, of, of former Soviet states. So we'd just be curious to hear your thoughts about um, the, the TB situation in those countries and how uh, the U.S. might direct some of the frankly, massive amounts of foreign assistance that are being poured into those countries to strengthen health systems and, uh, and, and address the real problems of, of people living there. Do I have any other comments or questions just now? Yes, Joel. <coughs> Joel Spicer, World Bank. Um, one quick comment on South Africa. Having come back recently from Swaziland and Lesotho, uh, I, I was led to see that no matter what Swaziland and Lesotho do to try and fight MDR, they'll never be able to get a lock on it because most of the cases are imported through miners working in South Africa. So when we talk about South Africa, I think one excellent opportunity for regional leadership on what is clearly uh, a global public goods issue would be for South Africa to, to play more of a role there in controlling from a, a regional point of view, supporting countries around it. Um, in terms of the financial crisis, uh, it's clear that with insufficient funding for health anyway, that the money we have for health has to be spent better. So when I think about the billions and the blood, sweat, and tears going into HIV AIDS, uh, which by my calculations is between 500 and 1,000 bucks to get someone on antiretrovirals, you think about how quickly that is wasted when the person gets infected and dies with TB, I mean, a couple weeks in some cases with MDR. Um, it, it makes me wonder if we're doing enough to wake up our brothers and sisters who are fighting and pulling the wagon on the HIV AIDS side. Do they get it enough? that the people they are trying to protect and the, the dollars that they are throwing at the problem are actually being eroded by something that's relatively cost effective to, to address. My personal feeling is, is no, they are not awake enough. We see a lot of policy statements, but when it comes right down to it at the ground, the HIV side is not screening for TB. Uh, there is not an awareness of this. There is no isolation uh, control, um, isolation facilities for people that are treated, and, uh, and it goes on. So what can we do? to wake them up, is my question. So, so in, 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 in terms of writing Brenda's story, <laughs> so sorry. which I would never really try and do, knowing how well she does it, but uh, I wouldn't, I don't actually think that the HIV, I would be cautious with the HIV numbers because that's really a reporting artifact. You know, the world, the, the number of cases didn't just double in the world. And I, I think we have to maintain a degree of, of rigor here. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say it's a big problem. But the fact that the numbers have increased because they're actually getting real data is more a statement about the need for real data than it is about the trend. I, I, I do also think that... I don't, maybe it's a slight attention deficit issue on my side, but I, I'm tired of the doom and gloom because it's not where I see the world right now. I mean, we've known there's, this problem's been out there for a long time, and, and, and the, the, the real story is the, the, op, is the optimism, which is, not, uh, which is not, in my mind, a confabulated story. I mean, it's that if you actually go and you look at those countries who are doing a good job, their TB rates are coming down. If you look at those countries that have good TB programs, they don't have drug resistance. If you look at those countries who have drug resistance, who are starting to take care of it, you know, patients are living who would have died. I, I, and, and then if you, if you combine that with, uh, with this uh, very real sea change, that we've seen in industry engagement in, in tuberculosis products. You know, six years ago, uh, there was just very little going on. Uh, and, uh, and now there are five major companies involved in vaccines. There are, there are these three drugs that are incredibly exciting. I mean, phase two studies are, are not a drug. I mean, I'm the first to admit that, but, but the idea that uh, you could take a couple of these pills, in these chemicals, mix them in a fixed dose combination, and, uh, and provide that as first-line therapy means that MDRTB 
is a historical oddity, right? Because these would be two molecules the world has never seen before. You could shut down every TB diagnostic, every, every drug susceptibility lab except for the research laboratories. And then if we could con ensure that they are delivered as fixed dose combinations and well-controlled programs and really defend against drug resistance, you know, this is an incredible vision. And uh, those are the stories that, that, that I'm most interested. Um, uh, I, to be honest, I, I don't know anything about the part of the world that, that, that you're asking about. So, uh, so I'm going to actually see if anyone in the audience uh, wants to talk about security and, and, and TB. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly not something I'm... Gene Bonventry, I've just retired from the Department of Defense and KCSIS with the Global Health Policy Center now. Uh, uh, the only thing I've heard about TB in relation to security is the risk of multiple drug resistant and XDR TB <coughs> in prison systems. And this is particularly a problem in Russia and some of Eastern Europe where entry into the prison system essentially is a death sentence for whatever, uh, uh, for whatever you're arrested for. And how that upsets the balance of of stability and security inside Russia mm. remains to be seen. And there are no uh, effective ways inside Russia to deal with that. But what a solution would be to that, uh, I'm not sure. It will take the epidemiologists and the security folks talking at the same table and trying to come to a common language that I don't think we're going to get. Mm. Hi, I'm <coughs> Charlotte Collins. Um, uh, related to that, one of the things I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on is in this very same region, when we talk about innovation and new tools, we have countries that still rely primarily on chest X-ray that aren't even doing smear microscopy and culture, much less rapid culture, liquid culture, DNA testing and whatnot. So not only do we – so we have like an extra barrier there that we don't even face in places like Sub-Saharan Africa where smear microscopy is more widely used. So I, I would be curious to hear as – your thoughts on as we talk about this innovation, there are some countries that are really important security-wise and that we need to get the, the techniques out there that are going to be a little bit more behind in terms of being willing to accept and innovate. Do you have any thoughts on, on how you can move that forward? Yeah. Actually, you know, Christy, I don't know if you see, but he's over there. <coughs> Christy Hansi from, from USID has been thinking quite a bit about this, this issue of, uh, of how how to roll out innovation, how to deal with – I mean, as best I can tell, there's nobody who adopts anything. They adapt everything. So the question is how do you adapt uh, in different settings? Well, thanks for putting me on the spot, Peter. But um, in, in response, I think, specifically for Eastern Europe, part – and just responding to that, not to the overall issue of, of adopting new tools, which is another hour's discussion. But in Eastern Europe, um, my understanding is that there's a real hesitancy to use sputum because it is such a unsophisticated, disgusting t technology that they're not very interested in using, and it's really a technology that's for Africa. My sense is that if, if new diagnostic technologies that are much more sophisticated were made available, they would be rather rapid um, adopters of the new technologies. So I don't think it's a matter of necessarily at this stage of the game saying you've got to get them on to get them using sputum so that then we can introduce other tools, they're going to be the ones that jump, I think, on the new tools very quickly. Peter, may I ask a couple questions? One, the – around Russia. I mean, we have a um, – it, it's it, – it remain – Russia remain. I realize you're a little reluctant to talk about some specific countries, but in the case of Russia, you've got this – recalcitrance and an outlier factor, and yet we're now in a period where there's at least a reappraisal around the bilateral relationship. We're holding a consultation with a number of Russian health experts here in Washington in early April, which I, I mean early May, which I take as a pretty significant shift in, in, the, in the willingness to engage on these matters. Do you see – my question is, do you, know, do you sense that there's – Within, with, within the community of folks that work officially and unofficially on these issues that there's some rethinking going on. Um, the, the, the second question has to do with the, 
with the, the inability of TB to acquire a dramatic face for an American policymaker. It's not, it's not something that seems to have the same kind of, of, of um, compelling personality as, as HIV. I mean, it doesn't have the same potency of threat. It's, not, uh, it's, it's, it's seen as a more diffused problem, whether correctly or incorrectly. Uh, it's one that, as you say, there are, there are little bump-ups, but it doesn't graduate into being something that is seen and understood. And exactly why is that? What is it endemically about this where you have this vagueness around the personality of something that is so important and the tolerance of an obsolete technology across the board? When you talk about the, the need for patience and a long-term time perspective on the development of new diagnostics, vaccines, and therapies, when you pointed out just how antiquated those are, I find that very compelling and mm -hmm. persuasive <coughs> that it's going to take a while to overcome that because we permitted this obsolescence to, 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 to exist and to deepen. But I don't understand why that, why that would be such a historical experience. It wasn't just us. Mm -hmm. It's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So how did how did we find ourselves mm -hmm. in that in that fix? Yeah. <clears throat> well, just to, to touch briefly on the on the Russia issue, you know, I uh, uh, early on, uh, Paul Farmer and, and Jim Kim, partners in health working in Tomsk, I think showed that there is a way to engage. In in uh, in that country, and, and in particular their their efforts in in Tomsk, which was you know it's a long hard slog at the beginning, but it has now become a uh, regional center for excellence, and is and is is really looked at as 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 lead innovators. Uh, I, I think that that may be the model for for working forward in in those settings. You know the the fact that that tuberculosis is is such a uh, Underappreciated problem is is something that I've I've never understood. I've probably heard thirty different explanations, um, and uh, but but I I, I had an experience uh, just in March. I was in um, Inner Mongolia, and uh, we were we were starting to scope out uh, some of the drug resistant uh, situation and opportunities uh, there, and. Uh, <laughs> It was it was really shocking to me because, you know, I think part of it is is when we think about, I mean, the success of Thompson has been incredible, um, but I, I I don't think that that when people think of drug resistant TB and they think of a of a cachectic tattooed prisoner in in a Russian system, uh, that it has actually captures the, the the real magnitude of the issue because, for me, the the TB issue is about uh, protecting our children from the future, and 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 this was was driven home to me because we were visiting a uh, a man who'd been really dragged into poverty because of the uh, having had three courses of therapy, and he'd failed his third course of therapy, and the medical system had assumed at this point that he had drug resistant TB, and and essentially abandoned him. So nothing more we can do. Go home. The the community that he lived in, a small community. Uh, uh, had uh, uh, basically ostracized them. I mean, they, they, they understood enough about airborne contagions to know that if the health system had no time for this guy, that their kids certainly shouldn't be playing there. And, and we went into the man's house, and, and as we were talking to him, I looked in the back room and I saw his wife breastfeeding a small child and, and, and kids' clothes over in the corner, and I realized that this is actually the face of MDR-TB. MDR-TB was going to kill this man. And the only legacy that his children was go were going to have was infection with a untreatable organism. And that it's really, you know, that, 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 that to understand that, that, that what the real threat of drug-resistant TB is, uh, is providing a, a better future for those children and thousands, you know, every, there are half a million cases and how many, how many children are being infected by those half million cases and what their life going to be like. Well, there's one scenario where their life is going to be fine. In 2017, we have a new combination of drugs. They get sick. They get treated. That's, it's a good thing. And another, you know, they grow up without a dad and without a future. And when they're sick, they too uh, will uh, slowly pass away. So, so I, I, I actually feel like as a community, we've not, um, 
we've not done a good job of telling the stories. You know, when you go to these communities and you talk to the healthcare providers, they get it. You know, they get it. They don't want to talk about pandemic flu. They want to talk about what to do with these, the, this waiting room full of coughing people who, uh, who they don't know what to do about. Thank you. Do you have any other comments or questions? Yes. Please identify yes. yourself. My name is Myra Arias, and I work with PATH. I just want to add um, the problem of MDR in all the Central Asian countries. And it's actually about um, the need to mobilize other organizations, you know, beyond the health organizations, because in this context, a lot of MDR is transmitted from migrant workers. So it, you know, takes involving for example, the International Labor Organization or International Migrant Organizations to actually buy into this initiative of controlling tuberculosis um, because otherwise um, I guess that it's, it's very important to bring into the table other um, opportunities beyond rapid diagnostics because if a lot of people don't have access to them, you know, it just uh, – leaves us to where we start off. So I think that it's uh, something that the WHO and other institutions have promoted is like private-public partnership. And in terms of uh, tuberculosis, we have to uh, look also into these other sectors to bring and involve and, you know, in conversations in the table so that they can contribute somehow to, to the fight against these epidemics. And also uh, about prisoners. Um, you know, they go back to the communities like we all know and we've been hearing about. And actually in those communities, like you say, they have their children. So also involving, uh, as it has been done lately, the penitentiary and ministries of justice, ministries of law. So I think, you know, a very comprehensive approach to bringing other organizations in, in Africa, like the miners, um, you know, industries and everything, to buy into this and invest in this, you know. I think that it has to be a kind of like, like you say, holistic approach, but also um, taking into account other aspects beyond the biomedical of tuberculosis, so. Thank you. I think we'll close on that, Peter. Yeah, yeah, maybe just that, yeah. maybe offer some closing remarks. You know, I, I, uh, I, I agree with everything that, that Myra said. I. I uh, I think that we are in the next six months faced with a critical moment in time for tuberculosis where uh, the stakes have been raised, the potential is there for upping our game to match that. That uh, the issue of HIV um, and the issue of, of MDR in particular have the potential to float all of the boats uh, in, in, in this point in time. And, and for example, I think it can change the economics. I mean, if right now we can be complacent about treatment of drug-susceptible TB, but in the context of the cost of treating that case if it's drug-resistant, that the public health system have to look at TB control with, a, with an understanding of MDR and with a whole different economic perspective. And I think the same is true in the private sector and vaccines in particular. You know, one of the reasons that vaccines have had problems getting traction is that it's a treatable disease. I mean, yeah, you get TB, you get treated, you know, but that's no longer true. And, you know, they, that if, when we're talking about a, a world in which there is MDR and XDR TB, then the, the market for a TB vaccine goes beyond the truly poor to the entire world. And, you know, some of the analyses that I've seen suggest that now you're talking about gross sales of $1.2 billion a year if the world were really concerned about drug resistance and really had a vaccine that could prevent that. That's an opportunity for funding phase three trials, in my opinion. And, and throughout all of this, I, I, I feel as though that now is a time uh, in the next uh, six months in which, which we really have to seize the urgency and, and, and try and make some real sustainable progress.